And uh, I would also like to say welcome to all. And as Carlos said, and also Klaus, it's very nice to see so many people from uh, all over the world here. So a big welcome to everyone. So I will talk about uh, introducing, introducing this and talk about climate projections. And uh, I will do this by talking about a number of different uh, questions. I will touch upon what actually quite basic things as what is a climate model and how do, do they work. And uh, I will also talk about how you run them and, uh, and uh, why it might be needed to do some more detailed regional modeling. I will go through a number of different uh, projects very briefly here, both with global climate models, but also regional climate models. And then a little bit touch upon what kind of uncertainties we deal with when we are talking about future climate change and how we can deal with them. And finalize with just a couple of slides on, on some of the results coming out of these model runs. And uh, I mean, this is really an introduction to the topic and there will be more talks detailing many of these different aspects later. But let's start here directly with uh, just talking about the climate model. A climate model should, of course, represent the climate system and all its different compartments. So a climate model should say something about both what's happening in the atmosphere, but also in the oceans and the land surface and, and how these different parts of the system really interact with each other. So a climate model needs to describe not only winds and clouds in the atmosphere and currents in the oceans, but also all of the exchanges between these pro the, so different processes in terms of fluxes like precipitation, evaporation and radiation, etc. So there are many different things that needs to go into a climate model. And the climate models, when we talk about them, we often talk about numerical climate models, and this is indeed what we are dealing with here as well. And they have as their fun fundamentals some kind of uh, equations that we are trying to solve. So these are what you can see now on the screen are some uh, partial di differential equations for describing the atmosphere and the motions in the atmosphere. And these can all be formulated in a numerical way. And then you can solve these equations for different volumes in the atmosphere. So we often set up some kind of uh, volumes where we can make these calculations in a kind of a grid net covering all of the globe, not just one point, of course, but the whole atmospheric column and also going down into the oceans but then also uh, covering all of the globe, basically. So these, all of these small volumes, in each of them, we make calculations for things like uh, temperature, wind speed, uh, pressure, and in the oceans, we can calculate salinity and other things as well. And uh, all of these grid boxes then exchange information with each other over a simulation. And all of this is coded, and there are hundreds of thousands of lines of computer code going into these models often. So, how do they work then in, in practice? I will just very briefly be a bit mathematical, but not, not very long here. So just look at this very quickly. This is the thermodynamic equation for the atmosphere in, in the equation system we just looked at. And it contains a term here, which, dis, which says something about how, in this case, temperature changes with time. And the nice thing here is that this is a function of things that we can really go out there and, and uh, calculate from the model directly. The state, we, we can look at the temperature and wind fields in the, in the atmosphere. And by just looking at where it's warm and where it's cold and how the wind is blowing, we can get an idea about if it's going to get warmer or colder where we are sitting. And uh, we also have a number of other things that we need to take care about, like uh, incoming solar radiation, for instance. Uh, if the so sun is up there, it's going to get warmer in a little while. And all of this can be calculated and, and uh, described in these models. So this is what, what they really do. So uh, it's quite simple in principle. So you just try to find an initial state for all of these different grid boxes in your model. And then you calculate tendencies by aid of the equation I just showed and other similar equations for motion, etc. And then you apply the tendencies, the idea about how much temperature really is changing, the rate of change, and you apply those tendencies to the state, and then you can get the new model state. That can be, say, half an hour into the future or something like that. And then you can restart again from, from the second step here. And then you can integrate forward in time, and this is how both actually weather forecast models and climate models work. And so it's quite simple in principle. So just to say a couple of words about weather forecast models and, and climate simulations, they do differ a bit, but the, the model tools are quite similar in the, in the, in the bottom there. Uh, but uh, for in weather forecasting, it's very important to get a very good picture of the initial state where we are today, since we want to know something about the, the weather tomorrow, and that's very much dependent on, on the state of the atmosphere today. So that in, in a weather forecast system, you 
apply a lot of observations. I know that at the European Center, I think they use something like 40 million different observations every day just in, in to get their global climate, global numerical weather forecast modeling working. In climate models simulations, it's a little bit different. It's also important with the initial state, but often we try to start these models, not now, but instead in the mid 19th century, like in the pre-industrial climate. And at that time, we don't have that much observation. So the models are often started from some initial model state. And then we are prescribing changes in forcing, and that can be uh, changes in greenhouse gas contents of the atmosphere, but also aerosol particles or changes in land use. And those changes are then applied to the model, both in the historical period, and then we can use observations to derive these uh, forcings. But then for the future, we are using scenarios for the future, since we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Climate model integrations are often very long and they can be run for centuries actually, while weather forecast model, they, they are just a couple of weeks at most. And the important thing here is that with the weather forecast model, you, you, can't, you can't make forecasts for too long time periods since the system is not really predictable on that level. And the climate model can, it, we can keep on integrating and, and, and uh, calculating and, and uh, deriving weather situations long time term into the future, but they are not predictive in that sense. So we can't say anything about, for instance, what's going to be the weather next summer or in, or in three years on a specific day, but we can give a realistic, if the model is good, description of the weather types over those days. And uh, thereby we can look at statistics of weather and that is what we often term as climate. So that's in principle how it works. And here we have one example from a global climate model where we have used the model to make a couple of simulations starting in 80, 1850, going up till now, and then also into the future. And there are three different simulations starting in 1850 from different initial conditions in that global climate model. And then we have applied changes in greenhouse gas concentrations and other things over the 20th century. And you can see that all of these three integrations here, the black, the pink and the yellow line, they follow some kind of increasing temperature trend up till around 2000. And then for the future, for the scenarios, they continue to increase. And then now the increase here is very dependent on which scenario we are using. To the right there, we are, we are looking at three different scenarios and they are here termed RCP 2.6, 4.5 and 8.5. I will get back to them a little bit later, but it's clearly, it's very clear from this picture that the scenario is very important for the future evolution. We can also see that these scenarios, they start diverge sometime, maybe around 2040 or so. But we can also see at these three different colors, the, the individual lines here are a bit different. So sometimes the black line is above the others and, and sometimes below. And that means that even with the same global climate model, the same forcing, they are still different a bit, both here, as we can see here in the global mean temperature, but also and even more if you look at regional signatures. So there can be years or even decades where Europe is colder in, in, some, in some model simulation and warmer in, in another. And that's just coming from so-called internal or natural variability of the system. And this is how the climate system really works. So that's also something we need to take into account here. So now we have talked a little bit about the models, how they work. And uh, now I will spend a few minutes here on the regional climate models and, and what they are and why, why, why we are using them. So uh, the global model I showed before, they are quite often run at relatively coarse resolution since they need to cover the whole globe, globe and it's expensive to have really high resolution and many, many grid points where you should do these calculations. So typical global climate models have resolution grid spacing of some one or 200 or even maybe 300 kilometer in, the, in, the, in these grid boxes I talked about before. So to the left there, we have a typical example over Scandinavia with a 225 by 225 grid box size. So it's quite coarse and uh, we can see already that some, the representation of the area is not very good in that model in terms of land sea contrasts, but also, and maybe even more important in terms of the height of the Scandinavian mountains, which is quite sh not so very high in, in, in that such a model here. So if you instead look at the, the, the middle one and the rightmost plot here, we have a much finer resolution. To the right, we are down to 12.5 by 12.5 kilometers. And this is what we are really using in this Eurocortex context and the regional climate projections that we are producing here in Copernicus. 
And now it's much better. The map lo starts looking at as the real map and the height of the mountains is also quite good. So in this case, the precipitation will mostly fall on the right side. And, and that's very good, of course, for a climate model. But it's not just the land surface and the topography. It's also, of course, the processes. If you think about such an area and you think about the weather systems, the very coarse model to the, to the left, it has difficulties in, in really simulating the low pressure systems and the clouds and the frontal systems. But a model like the one to the right has, is better opted to do that. So it, it gets more, more realism, not just in the uh, physiography, but also in, in the processes that we are trying to simulate here. So the problem here, of course, is that the high resolution really costs a lot. So if we go from the very leftmost plot to the rightmost one there, there is an almost 6,000 fold increase in the computing power needed for doing simulations there. So you can realize it's, it's very, very costly and it's difficult to run global models. And the, this is really where the regional climate models come in into play. So this is what we usually do. We take a global climate model that has been applied globally and then from that model we take boundary conditions both lateral boundary conditions but also sea surface conditions if if needed if we are on, on in oh, somewhere where there is an ocean and also sea ice and then we feed those numbers and values into the regional model and we do the calculations and integrations within the small smaller domain here like here over europe uh, where we take boundary conditions every sixth or third hour or something like that and then we can feed in that to the regional model and do more uh, uh, yeah, detailed calculations over the region in question and this gives an um, improved regional result but uh, still at a, at a reasonable cost as well so we just give you two examples here of where we have shown or where that where that has been shown to improve the situation and, and uh, one is here from the alpine region it's a paper that is a couple of years old it shows here a global model uh, to the top at quite coarse resolution again and uh, then the final resolution at the bottom there the, the really finest one is the again the same as as we are talking about here in the cortex and to the right we can see precipitation in winter in these models in the top row again is the global climate model uh, and at the bottom the very bottom row there is there are observations and you can see that the global model on top has have very difficulties in, in both getting the small scale details of course in the rightmost plots but also upscaled at the global model resolution the the, the global model has di have has difficulties in, in getting the right amount of precipitation while then the uh, uh, regional climate model at the 12 kilometer resolution, this is the middle row instead, it has a much better ability to both capture the small scale details, but also get the precipitation right on, on the larger scales as well. So this is a very good example of what we call added value of these regional models on the seasonal time scale. Uh, also important here is, is like streams and, and uh, heavy precipitation and this is one example from Sweden uh, to cities in Sweden where uh, we have observations of uh, high intensity uh, rainfall with short duration. This is what's shown in the two di diagrams to the right. So for uh, like one hour precipitation the observations the black lines that go up to something like almost 40 millimeters per hour in, in, in the observations. And you can see that the increasing or refining the scale of the regional models also improves the situation. So going from the coarse scale red line to the fine scale blue and yellow lines, we are improving the ability of the model to really simulate intense precipitation as well. So there is no doubt that these high resolution regional models can add some value to the global climate models. So now I will quickly talk a little bit here about uh, CMIP and Eurocortex, what that is. And um, we start here with the uh, Cortex then. And uh, Cortex is uh, something called a Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment. And it's run under the WCRP, which is WMO's Climate Research Program. Uh, Cortex was founded in, in one of the reasons was really to provide high resolution information for all continents and there has been focus both on Africa before but now basically on all continents there are cortex domains and we are here talking about the European part and the Euro cortex but in Copernicus there is also they are also making available uh, regional climate data from also from these other, other domains as well. In Europe, we have now produced more than 100 different simulations at uh, really high resolution, 12.5 kilometer grid distance. And uh, Copernicus here has financed a lot of them in, in a project here uh, called Principles that we are soon about to finish. 
And the CMIP then, these are the global models, the underlying global models. So these are big uh, coupled model intercomparison projects. There have been several of them and we are now in the, in the sixth phase here. This is the most recent ones and these new simulations, they will be assessed uh, to a great degree in, in the next IPCC report coming out later this year and next year. Uh, but we also have CMIP5, which where the models was, were run like almost 10 years ago now, and those, those were already assessed in, in the fifth assessment reports. And uh, actually for Eurocortex, we have been working primarily with CMIP5 since uh, due to data avail availability, since the CMIP6 models have not been available for that long. So Eurocortex at the moment is still based on CMIP5. And this goes also for the other cortex regions around the world, primarily CMIP5, I would say. And CMIP, as you can see on the, on the view graph there to the right, there are many different projects and parts of CMIP addressing different questions about processes in the atmosphere and scenarios for the future and, and different things. Uh, but one important part is also cortex, which is now part of CMIP6 actually, to look more into impacts and, and uh, the, the regional and, uh, and, and local scales. So uh, we have, I will spend a couple of minutes now just saying a few words about typical uncertainties that we are facing when we are looking at climate change and future climate change and uh, also a word or two about how we can try to deal with them. And uh, the first and obvious thing is of course that we don't know about the future what the forcing will be and we have no idea about the future. So therefore we are assessing a large number of different scenarios. And here is one graph uh, illustrating this with uh, almost 1,000, I think, scenarios that were assessed in the last big IPCC report. And they have been uh, collected in something called representative concentration pathways. And these are the thick lines here, the, the thick red, blue, and yellow, and, and gray lines, representing different uh, stories for the future with different emissions, and then therefore also different forcing on the climate system at the end. And we can just quickly look at the red one with really high emissions and uh, very strong forcing, but also large increases in carbon dioxide emissions. While the blue one, the RCP 2.6, likely even requires that carbon dioxide is removed from the system in order to get to those levels. So they, they really span a very, very wide range at the end. And they, of course, also include other things than not just CO2, but also aerosols, etc. So one idea here is to really use different scenarios since we don't know about the future. Another thing is that the models are also giving some different results. And this is a result from uh, shown in the IPCC report, AR5 uh, in 2013, indicating changes in, in precipitation over Europe. And uh, there is a very distinct and, and clear pattern with the green colors increasing precipitation in the north and yellow ones and de decreasing drier, a drier climate in the south. Uh, and this is quite distinct, but if we then start looking at the hatching here, which says, tells us something about to what degree these different simulations are agreeing with each other. And then there is an area in between where there is no real agreement, not even on sign of change. And this is uh, from an ensemble of almost 40 different global climate models assessed in, in that, in that, in that uh, report. So again, we try to also, we would like to use several different models since we don't know which one of these models is the best one at uh, representing or presenting, pr projecting anything about future changes. So these bold things out here to the left is a strategy that we can use to use many different scenarios, many different models, and also many, many different ensemble members representing what I called before the, the internal or natural variability of the system. And the spread can then be used to illustrate things that are more robust, like the green and the yellow patterns here, and the, also where we have uncertainties in, 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 in some kind of climate change signal. So this is what, what we have done here in Eurocortex. You will hear more about this matrix next time, but this is an attempt then to really address uh, different scenarios. These are highlighted to the left there, the RCP 8.5, 4.5, and 2.6, really spanning the full range. And to the left, we have a number of global climate models that, that have been downscaled by uh, almost 10 different regional models. These are in the, in, the, in the columns there. So all of these colored fields here are where we have made simulations. And, and now this, this experiment can really be used to assess climate change, but also to understand and try to understand what are the uncertainties. We just uh, give one result and then tell you a little bit about what kind of data that is available from, from the models. 
so we know that the RCMs, they, they do to some extent also actually change the, the global climate model result. We already saw that from the precipitation of the, of the Alpine region, but we can also see that even on a regional scale, large scale features like temperature, for instance, can be altered by the global, by the regional models. So here is one example from part of Europe where uh, we look at biases compared to observations and the global climate model column to the left indicate that these models are, several of them have some warm biases. And there is one with the cold as well. But then if you look at the RCMs, the regional models, they are kind of changing that signal a little bit into a slightly colder bias in, in many of them. So there are changes in, in both in today's climate, but there is also a change in some of these models in, the, in terms of how they represent future climate change. And this is illustrated here for Scandinavia in summer where we, we have plotted precipitation changes against temperature changes. And uh, here you can see that the, the blue kind of ellipse there indicates where the GCMs project changes and then where the same, where the RCMs downscaling the same GCMs projected. So a slight change here in, in the signal. And these are things that can be really assessed and, and work with these high resolution data. So my final slide here is just to say that we have uh, now more than 100 different projections available and they are being made, made available also through Copernicus here. And it consists of uh, almost 10 different or regional models at high resolution running all over Europe. And uh, they take boundary conditions from almost 10 different global models. And we have three different scenarios. And for some of these, we also have different ensemble members so we can address internal variability. Typical variables that are uh, stored from these simulations are both variables for the atmosphere, atmosphere itself at, at different levels, like temperature, humidity, etc., but also fluxes like rainfall, snowfall, etc., and uh, solar radiation and, and uh, all different kinds of fluxes. And we also have a large number of variables for the surface as well, soil temperature and humidity, etc. And these data, they are stored at least daily, but often more frequently than that. Than that. So there are a lot of data being made available for, for downloading and use for different uh, purposes. And by that, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention.